GIP-12B, Gyokudo's Mists and Clouds and Addendum. Uh, but it isn't quite all after all for tonight, because after preparing and, and recording all that, I found the slides for the Lee Hung album, which I talked about, but showed only in two images that were copied from reproductions in Steve Addis's book. Uh, this album is important for the study of Nanga painting and its Chinese sources, because according to Addis, it was probably owned by Taiga and Chikuden before Gyokudo acquired it, and several Nanga artists made complete copies of it. So just making it accessible in good images seems worth doing, apart from anything that I have to say about it. So first image, please. In the previous lecture, 12A, I told about discovering Japanese Nanga painting, for myself that is, when a great exhibition of Japanese art came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1953, while I was a fellowship student there, and how the Nanga paintings in it excited me so much that I decided to take on this subject for research and writing during my times in Japan. Nanga painting was almost completely unknown in the U.S. at that time, and pretty much every place else outside Japan. And I told about how one of the most exciting works in that 1953 exhibition, for me, was a great album of landscape paintings by Uragami Gyokudo, titled Album of Mists and Clouds, but that I had lost my slides of it and couldn't talk about it. Now I've found those old slides in our departmental collection, and I'll show them and talk about that album in this addition to Lecture 12A, which was devoted to the Ju Ben Jugi pair of albums by Taiga and Busan, and the Mata Mata Ichiraku Jo album by Chikuden. I won't repeat that whole story, but let me just summarize it for those of you who tuned in late, so to speak. Next. I saw the Gokudo album in the great exhibition of Japanese painting and sculpture that came to the Met in 1953 while I was a fellowship student there. The head of the group of Japanese curators who accompanied the exhibition was Masao Ishizawa, who later became the director of the Yamato Bunkakan, a very rich private museum located near Nara. This is a photo made in, the later, in a later year when I was in Japan with my family. Dorothy, Sarah, Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas looking rather scruffy. We had been traveling and dropped in there uh, by chance, or anyway, after travel. Ishizawa-san had explained to me about what Nanga was, literally Southern School painting, when we talked at the Met. It's a school of artists who aspired to being the Japanese equivalents of the literati or the scholar amateur painters of Mingqing, China. I was later to bring to the U.S. the first exhibition of it ever shown outside Japan. My Scholar Painters of Japan call on the Nanga School, uh, an exhibition of 1972. But that was still in, far in the future. Next. When I came to Japan a year later in the fall of 1954 as a Fulbright student, I was taken around to visit collections and view their holdings by m my friend, the dealer Mayuyama Junkichi, with whom I'm seen here, and my teacher Shimada Shujiro. On one great trip, I traveled with Shimada to Tokyo, and then from there went off to see, in the company of Mayuyama, two major collectors of Japanese paintings in the Kanto or Tokyo Kamakura region. Next. One of those collectors, whom I've talked about in previous lectures, was the great novelist Kawabata Yasunari, at whose house I saw the two albums by Taiga and Busan and also a masterwork of Uragami Gyokudo, his Toun Shisetsu. I'll talk about that at length in a future lecture. But before going to Kawabata's, we went to the home of a collector named Umezawa, and there we saw again, I saw again, that is, the Album of Mists and Clouds, or Enkajo, by Gyokudo. That is the subject of this lecture. And I made slides of all the leaves and used them many times in later years in talking about this remarkable work, the one we're about to see. The album is now in the Umezawa Memorial Museum. Next, please. The best book on Gyokudo in English, the only one, I think, is uh, Tall Mountains and Flowing Waters, The Arts of Uragami Gyokudo by Stephen Addis. 
developed out of his doctoral dissertation on the artist that he wrote at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he studied for several years. After he had already established himself as a musician, he was part of a singing duo, Edison Crowfoot. Readers of my website will be familiar with the wonderful recordings made by Bill Crowfoot and others. Anyway, since Gokudo was also a musician who played the chin, the Japanese koto or zither, and composed music for it, Edis was uniquely qualified to write about him as both musician and painter. Steve and I were good friends once. We stayed in each other's houses and so forth, but we had a falling out years ago, and I haven't been in touch with him for a long time. Anyway, his book, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 1987, can certainly be recommended reading on Gyokudo. Steve is also something of an amateur artist himself. What you see beside him in this photo was one of his own works, not, I hasten to add, by Gyokudo, who is free and sketchy, but not that free and sketchy. Next. Before turning to his paintings, a few words about his life and his other art, playing the shin and composing for it. Uh, this painting, copied from the reproduction in Addis's book, depicts Gyokudo playing the chin, and is by his son Shunkin, who is himself a painter, very prolific, but far less original and interesting than his father. Uragami Gyokudo, born in 1745, began his life as a clan official, serving the Ikeda clan at Bizen in modern Okayama prefecture. In 1794, after the death of his wife and some other misfortunes, Gyokudo left clan service, giving up the economic and other security that it provided, to become a wanderer and a recluse. Between this departure and his death in 1811, he spent most of his time living alone, sometimes visited by friends of similar tastes for poetry and music, going outdoors to enjoy natural scenery and play his chin. Uh, he also traveled himself to stay with friends or at temples. Some of the best work was done to repay hospitality. The same is true, of course, of many famous Chinese artists, such as Ni Zan and Wang Meng. Uh, this late period is the time of Gyokudo's finest work as a painter. So, back to his paintings. Next. I will devote most of the later lecture to Gyokudo's paintings, so I'll show only a few here to introduce him. These are two of the best-known examples of his hanging scrolls. The one at left titled, Building a Hut in the Mountains, Ink and Colors on Silk, painted in 1792. And at right is Two Peaks Embracing Clouds, one of his most impressive works. We'll spend time with both of those in the later lecture. Next. Uragami Gokudo's landscapes mostly follow the conventions in their subjects. Foregrounds with trees on the river banks, often houses and figures, hills or mountains rising beyond. But nothing else about them is conventional. He likes to give them four character titles, some of which he took or adapted from a Chinese album he owned, which I'll talk about later. Next. He likes to tip up the flat-topped earth forms to show them as circles or ovals, and to give his mountains strange shapes. And above all, especially in his late years, he likes to render all this in a loose, sketchy, sometimes eccentric kind of brushwork. This is brushwork that a traditional Chinese connoisseur would hate, maybe refuse to look at. The Japanese Nanga painters, even while they were aspiring to painting like the literati artists of Mingqing, China, didn't have enough of their works to copy or imitate closely. And that, I've sometimes argued, was their salvation. But I'll save that argument for a later lecture, probably the one on the early Nanga artist Sakaki Hyaksen. Next. I myself once owned a late, sketchy Gyokudo. I gave it to the University Art Museum, now Berkeley Art Museum, where it can still be seen. It combined on a single sheet of paper an inscription by a famous contemporary of his, Murase Kote, written within a roughly drawn square, and below that, as seen here, painted within a similarly rough-drawn circle, a late, sketchy landscape by Gyokudo. That, too, I'll talk about in the later lecture. Now, at last, on to the album of mists and clouds. Next. But first, here are two leaves from the album by Li Hang or Li Chu Bo, 
copied from Addis's illustrations. I have original slides of all the leaves of this album somewhere, made from the original in the Yabumoto collection, but I can't find them now. I may show them in a later Gyokudo lecture. Li Hung, or Li Chu Bo, is an unidentified artist known only from this single album. The owner, Yabumoto, Yabumoto Sogoro, even suspected that he might be Korean. I think probably Chinese is more likely, but anyway, an unknown artist. Leaving that aside, we can see how this album supplied Gyokudo with examples of relatively traditional Chinese landscape types, foregrounds with trees, sometimes buildings and figures, hills beyond the river, and supplied him also with four character titles that he could adopt or adapt. These two were titled Evening Rain by the Village Stream that left and Clear Skies on a Sunny Summer Day that right. Gyokudo acquired this album in 1806. It is said to have been previously owned by Ike no Taiga. The album has 11 leaves and is painted in ink, except for a few leaves that have touches of red color on them. This is an unusual feature that Gyokudo also copies in his own album. Now, next please. The first leaf in Gyokudo's album is titled Trailing Clouds and Mists. Most of the leaves have four character titles, as I say, taken or adapted from that album by Lee Hung, and perhaps others uh, that Yokudo had seen. But Chinese compositions and titles only make up a kind of springboard from which Yokudo flies off into his own highly individual style and imagery. Seen already here is his insistent repetition of horizontal and slanting strokes of ink graded from darker foreground to lighter background in the traditional way. He likes rounded or oval forms, uh, the kind of arching brush movement seen here. Reddish markings scattered freely on the trees, but also apart from them, indicate the autumn season. The Chinese landscapist practice, used from the Yuan period onward, of separating near from far by a band of mist or fog across the base of the mountains, is followed here, as in many others of Gokudo's paintings. But most striking of all is the looseness of his brushwork or drawing. The next. The title of the second leaf I can't read. It may be something like crossing a bridge, carrying a chin. Most striking in it are the repeated squares of dark strokes representing trees. Two figures are seen on the bridge at the bottom one of them making his way toward houses beneath trees at the right. Rows of houses across the river make up a village, and a single pavilion is seen on the mountaintop at left. And perhaps, it's not really clear, markings that are meant to represent another pavilion up at the very top. The brushwork here creates an effect of surface agitation that dominates the picture. Next. The third leaf also has a title that is partly unreadable by me, but the second and fourth characters mean valley and forest, so it's something valley and something, I think, dense forest. And indeed, it represents a steep-sided valley opening onto a river and houses in the valley. The further shore is only simply sketched. Next. Now, with the fourth leaf, the real excitement begins. The title appears to read something like traveling by boat or maybe stopping at a house Anyway, a man is in a boat, the kind with covered area used for traveling, and he approaches the shore where there is a waterside open pavilion, and behind it, houses among trees, a very traditional subject. But again, this is only a base from which Gokudo takes off into a highly individual direction, most of all making the highest mountain push rightward and touch the top of the leaf. He often painted while tipsy, can we suppose a cup of sake between each of the two leaves? Anyway, the scenes and their styles are getting stranger and stranger. The few touches of red color are another departure from normal practice, which would give us either an ink monochrome painting or one with more extensive coloring. And as I said, he adopted this from the album by Li Hung. Next. The fifth leaf is titled Reading the Book of Changes by a Mountain Stream. And indeed, we see, through the round window of the house, elevated on the river shore, a man holding an open book, the Book of Changes, the I Ching. 
The tangle of trees as Jokudo's play on this familiar element of traditional landscapes, and again a few smudges of reddish color suggest autumn. But what are those strange repeated angular forms looking like the sails of boats in the ravine above in upper right? Does he mean those for houses? The hill to the left of those and the slope below at right are shaped with curving lines that make them bulge outward. Here is a truly inspired amateur playing with old conventions as he imperfectly understands them from paintings he has seen. Next. Leaf 6, with a title that Addis translates as Deep Secluded Canyon, is still looser and freer to the point where we can't say whether some of the wildly curving brushstrokes belong to the trees or to the hills. A bent-over figure walking with a cane crosses the bridge. Again, a few smudges of reddish color, which Gokudo seems to have applied sparsely, perhaps after the leaves were otherwise finished, with no special seasonal intent. This one brings us to a climax. Six large cups, or bottles maybe of sake, let's say, have loosened his hand and his vision. What can come next? A move into complete abstraction? Next, please. Not at all. Instead, we arrive at the wonderful leaf that is pretty much everybody's favorite in the album, the one usually reproduced in color to represent the album, as in Addis's book. It's titled Green Mountains, Red Forests, and it represents just that, except that the mountains are treated with ink wash instead of green, a color contrast that would have disrupted the unity of the leaf. We enjoy here the same kind of ideal balance of somehow moving scenery with the visual excitement of the artist's hand that makes viewing some of the paintings of Van Gogh, for instance, such a moving experience. A waterfall drops between the two hills, and in the foreground we make out figures and buildings. Looking closer at these, we see, next please, two figures, one in lower left, the other in upper right of this detail, walking bent and with a staff over what appears to be a bridge. Both are approaching a house. A pavilion for viewing scenery is above to the left. The rubbed-on red color works effectively here to permeate the whole scene and increase the visual richness of surface. Next. The hill above is more strongly shaped, with repeated upward curving lines rounding its slope and giving it volume. Has Gokudo sobered up then and painted this the next morning? while fresh and creatively strong. However that may be, and of course it's only imagination, uh, the leaf raises our expectations beyond what any of the earlier ones had promised. And indeed, when we turn to the next leaf, next please. It's an absolute knockout. To understand how this album absolutely bowled me over and started me on the pursuit of Nanga artists and their paintings that has occupied so much of my scholarly career, you have to imagine this young scholar, I was still in my 20s in 1953 when I had the Metropolitan Fellowship, young scholar familiar with Japanese art but of a much tamer kind. Nothing like this could have been seen before outside Japan. A uh, young scholar living in New York and much caught up in the excitement of the new abstract expressionist movement there and its charging of brushstrokes with energy and expression somewhat apart from their function in defining an image, and now turning a leaf of a Japanese painting album and being confronted with this. The impact it had on me lasts to today, nearly 60 years later. The whole upper part of the picture has dropped any semblance of realistic scenery and presents us with a mountain that twists as it pushes out the top of the painting, even as it's shaped and given volume by a few seemingly loose strokes which echo the upper branches of the pine. And what are those forms that left? A river and a waterfall? And what does it matter? Attempting a naturalistic reading of such a picture is missing the expressionist point. Now, having held you gazing at this extraordinary leaf for a long time, I draw you down into the woods for a detail, which brings out even more vividly the intense agitation of the brushwork. The repeated strokes in lower right, meant to be foliage between tree trunks, 
even take on a kind of spiral form as Gyokudo doesn't lift his brush between one and the next, but lets it run on. A round-topped house is seen through the trees, its roof touched with a red color, a kind of spire rising from it, a curtained window below. These are not easy to read as parts of a coherent image, and we can read them only because we recognize the original pictorial form that is almost flown apart into unreadable brushstrokes. Next. The ninth leaf returns us to the looser kind of ink monochrome image of the early leaves with a single touch of red. The title reads, Something Wind, Something Water. Two boats of the traveling kind are drawn up on the shore next to a waterside pavilion with a strange tree exposing its long trunk and branches with bushy foliage along it. Above is another mountain that goes out the top of the picture, but more quietly this time and not tilted. Next. Leaf 10 is titled, in Addis's translation, Where is the Ferryman? Question mark. But it could be, less dramatically, asking about the ferry or something like that. All the earth forms in it uh, seem set on a sharply tilted ground plane. No figures or boat are visible, at least to my eye. And it's hard to read what the artist means by the forms that fill the canyon ac across the river. The main mountain is again drawn with a sense of volume and pushes against the upper edge of the picture. Next. The eleventh leaf, the next to last, is titled Doing Something, I don't know what, in a fishing boat and is more simply pictorial than most of the others, with a fisherman in his boat, presumably a gentleman fisherman, doing it as a leisurely pursuit not to catch fish. He and the boat are placed a short distance offshore beyond the simple bridge in the lower left corner. The grove of trees, some of them in the autumn color, is also more clearly readable as an image than those in most of the other leaves. And the progression into depth from the middle ground spit of land coming in from the right to the succession of three simple round-topped hills further back is clarified by some adherence to the traditional practice of reducing detail and lightening the tonality as we are carried back, with simple strokes of light wash over the first hill at upper right, and then none at all on the further two hills, all of them shaped with upward arching strokes, and pinned down with little clusters of dien or dots on their summits. This is a leaf that returns us to a simpler mode that follows tradition more closely. Is Gokudo sobering up? He signs his name simply Gokudo after the title in upper left. This is the first leaf to be signed this way. Next. The twelfth and final leaf, titled About to Snow in the Ravine, brings the album to a quiet and somewhat traditional close. Albums of landscapes usually ended with winter scenes, a remnant probably of the album that carried the viewer through the months of the year, ending in winter. A thatched roof hut is seen through the trees at left, and in it, visible through the square window, a man. A pattern of tree branches above, and the mountain slopes across the river seen through and above them, suggest spatial depths without quite defining them clearly. And broad, dark, horizontal strokes fill the wintry sky above. This one, too, Yokudo signs with his name. It's a satisfying ending to this visually rewarding and highly original album. This leaf could have served as a kind of tryout for Gyokudo's finest and most famous painting, next please, his great To and Shisetsu, Evening Clouds and Sifted Snow, a hanging scroll that has the special distinction of being a designated Japanese national treasure. But the story of how I saw that and photographed that and got to know its very distinguished owner belongs in another lecture, one on Nanga paintings and other forms in which Gokudo will be the featured artist. For that, you'll have to wait a few more months while I gather the images and the information and prepare it. This lecture on four Nanga albums ends here. I hope it's been as engrossing an experience watching it as it has been for me preparing and recording it. And that's all for tonight.